if you're like, okay, 20% of the week is too dangerous for us to deploy on, um, there should be a pretty big reason for that. Um, anytime you're deploying code, let's start with this, you should only deploy if you have the time to sit there and watch and wait and verify that it's working, right? You shouldn't deploy at 4.59 on any day if you plan on leaving at 5 p.m., right? Yeah, <clears throat> I think that's deploy. the nuance that a lot of people just uh, don't talk about um, that, okay. Yeah. About, oh yeah, in the beam to deploy means that you trust your system, your automation, um, but- I mean, you own your shit, right? Like, okay, if you have perfect confidence that your change is fine and you can walk out the door, cool. But if, it, if something breaks, <laughs> you're the one that's going to fix it and you're going to get chewed out from not exercising good engineering judgment, right? This is about good engineering judgment. The The other thing that I, I, I want, the other subtlety that I think gets lost in this is that what I'm, what I'm advocating is not um, that you make rules about when to deploy or not to deploy. It's, it's really that as soon as you merge your code, you should assume it's going out, right? You should assume it. Ideally, there would be some automated process that once you've merged, it runs all the tests and then it promotes it to production, right? Um, the problem is that, and, and then you use your engineering judgment out when to merge, right? And that's that's where the judgment comes in. And then you wait, which is only fast, which is only possible with the fast deploy cycle, obviously. Um, the problem is when you disconnect those, when you're like, I want to merge my code, I don't know when it's going to go out. Well, that's bad <laughs> because the whole point is ownership and that you need to be there to make sure that you're, that you're, you know, so there's this whole hierarchy of things that need to be able, it need to be in place before you can just like deploy on Fridays, but they're all things that you should do. They're all things you should do anyway. It's almost like being able to, to deploy on Friday is the, is the cherry that you get on top of your cupcake in order for, you know, eating your, 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 your vegetables. Um, but because when when you disconnect merging from deploying, uh, you get a whole bunch of really pathological behaviors like diffs just start to pile up and then a bunch of them get deployed at once at some unknown point in the future when none of those developers are watching. And then when something breaks, you don't know which of those diffs was at fault, right? So like this is an argument for tightening up all of that and, and executing good engineering judgment um, not for just being like YOLO. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's uh, kind, of, kind of going back to uh, the, the DevOps principles again about the being able to shorten that time between yes, pushing it's it. Everything. Yep. And I get it. Like our jobs are complicated. The world is complicated. Teams are complicated. I think that a lot of engineering leaders get paralyzed by that and they start just firefighting, right? And so they're like, you know, they're like, oh, well, co our code review turnaround time is too long. So let's, let's attack that problem. Or, you know, our tool chain is, you know, let's attack that problem. These are all symptoms and pathologies. You know, if you want to improve your team's performance, their quality of life and your software's quality, you need to focus on one thing, <laughs> focus on shortening that interval and tightening that ownership loop so that you merge your code and it gets deployed and you look at it and you don't walk away from your desk until you've closed that loop and verified that your code is working. Solve that and all of these, almost all of these pathologies and, and symptoms they it, it, it gets solved upstream from them. They never have a chance to pr proliferate, right? The whole like, review turnaround time thing. Well, you know, it reviews are turnaround in a long time if diffs are long. Diffs are long if reviews <laughs> turnaround time is long, right? Like all of these things just kind of like, you're either in this, I think like it's software engineering death spiral of everything getting longer and slower and taking more time and taking more people and resources, or <laughs> you have some discipline and you kind of fix it at the, at the source and you keep that cycle really tight. Yeah, I agree. And uh, yeah, that the whole thing about uh, oh yeah, after you de deploy something, just uh, just sit there and make sure that it's actually okay before you walk away. That's you instrument your code thing. as you're writing it, and then you look at it through the lens of the instrumentation you just wrote. Like you should never deploy code that you can't go then and look at that instrumentation and say, is it working as I expected it to? Does anything else look weird? If you can't answer those questions, you shouldn't have deployed that code. You should not have, that instrumentation was not sufficient, right? The one thing I, I know we're out of time, uh, but the one thing I want to say is that I hear from a lot of people who, who hear all this stuff and they're like, oh yeah, wouldn't that be nice, you know, but like, you know, we couldn't do that here or like, you know, 
the the saddest thing that I hear is when people are like, that's only for really great teams. <laughs> of course you can do that. You work with all these great engineers, right? X Google, X Facebook, X all these things. And like, that is so sad. And it is so not true. It is so not true. It, like I said before, it is so much easier to work with a short cycle time than with a long cycle time. It is hard to work with a long cycle time. Every engineer out there who is capable of instrumenting their code and debugging it in production, every engineer out there who has had to, you know, if you if you can't debug anything in production, okay, start there, sure. But like, you all are capable of this and it's not that hard and it just takes baby steps. You just plug away at it, shorten that, Shorten that cycle and, and everything else will fall into place. I promise you. That reminds me of something that uh, Kent Beck uh, said uh, that you know, people think he's a great engineer, uh, but he's, uh, he thinks himself as a good engineer with great habits. So once you start yes. building those great habits, uh, uh, you yes. can be you know, just as good as any of the engineers that you think yes. you know, that's so good that they can do all these things. Exactly. I love that quote. I, I have a similar one, which is that great engineers are made by great teams where they where they yeah. learn those great <laughs> habits. You know, at Honeycomb, we don't try to hire the most brilliant software engineers. We're not even trying to hire great software engineers. We're trying to hire good software engineers who are great teammates. Because ultimately, the smallest unit of ownership is not a person, it's a team. And you need to be constantly improving together in little ways every day. Yeah, what's that, uh, uh, what's that? What's the name of the Google research project about the team uh, success rate? And they found that the number one predictor for team success was not about the individual, but just about the team um, safety, how safe people feel safety. with each other. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's called the Phoenix Project or something. I never remember. The other thing that I loved from that project was um, the anecdote that, you know, she started by watching all of these doctors and she found that uh, the highest performing doctors reported the most errors. Counterintuitive, right? But it's because they felt safe with each other to just be like, this didn't work, this didn't work, this didn't work. And, you know, they had trained themselves not to brush over those things, but to really notice them and like keep hold themselves honest. I think about that almost every day. Yeah, the doesn't the, 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 the isn't there like a uh, like a saying in the Silicon Valley or something that uh, no, you learn more from failures than you do from successes. Absolutely. So this uh, is very much a, the, the being to openly talk about failures and what you can learn from that uh, is yep. uh, is a very you know, very valuable way to grow. Yeah, I feel like you know it's not like all engineers have achieved this everywhere by any means, but like the practice that. Of, of blameless retros that we've all been kind of like drilling into ourselves for the past decade and a half. Um, you know, I, and now I look at other teams that haven't, you know, other parts of the company that haven't had that history and there's so much trauma there. There's so, people are so afraid, to, you know, we're all naturally kind of afraid to be like, Oh, this didn't work. But like, I feel like the process of like retraining ourselves to, to celebrate failures, to like, be like, Oh my God, you found that. Thank you. Right. Is, is something that, you know, it's, it's, it's a question of life or death for, for companies that really want to succeed.